thanks everyone for joining us. We're here with a, a brand new series of conversations that we're going to touch on true crime topics, cases from uh, the UK, cases from around the world that, that span decades. Some are old, some are recent, and uh, very excited to be working with John Wedger on this because he gives a, a an alternate insight into things because of his uh, his career history and his insight into into some of these cases. So thank you very much, John, for for agreeing to do this first of all and giving up your time. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no worries at all. It's uh, it's an absolute pleasure. It's an honour for me to um, to help, and um, I'm looking forward to it. Well, we appreciate that. And tonight we're going to jump into a case that maybe a lot of the American viewers and viewers from around the world might not be familiar with, and it's the case of Jill Dando and her murder and all the things that are tied in with this conspiracy and what really happened because. It's one of those cases that when it happened, it was massive and it just teetered off into the realms of forgottenness. And I, I, there's a lot of reasons why I think this case needs to be uh, continued to be brought to light. And we want to touch on a few of those tonight. But John, how how do you feel about this case initially before we dive into the history? And this is very much a introductory video to the case for those who don't know uh, the, the Dando case. So if you do know it, forgive us if this is a little bit boring to begin with, if it's uh, all f you know knowledge that you have. But John, how do you feel about the case? Before we get started, how does uh, how do you think that case stands in the in the history of, of crime in the UK? Well, you know, in it, a huge question mark over the, the investigation of this case. And, and you get that quite a bit. There's been quite a few cases where and again, we're concentrating on the Metropolitan Police, which was the force that, that, that I served with, as, you know, as a uniform officer and mainly as a detective. And some of the officers that were on the Dando case, I knew um, on, on a, a, a lower level and a senior level. So, um, I mean, this occurred in 1999, if my memory serves me well, and Jill Dando was a, um, a TV presenter. And... Well, it was she actually presented a really popular um, crime, um, real life crime series called Crime Watch, in which they would um, uh, put up uh, active crimes and ask the public for assistance. It was, and she was a, pro, a presenter, a co presenter in that for many, many years. And, and she, she was shot dead. I think she was shot in the head at a, a close range on a doorstep um, in the Fulham area, which is quite an affluent residential middle class area of, of uh, central stroke southwest london and it, it gained massive um public interest because she was a well-liked individual she's a very attractive woman um and she come across as a very humble nice sweet easygoing sort of person so the public liked her and therefore you know there was a lot of um interest in, in her death. But. Within the last hour, it's been announced that the television presenter Jill Dando has died after being attacked outside her London home. Police say she was found in the street this lunchtime with serious head injuries and was taken to the Charing Cross Hospital. Ms Dando, who presented the BBC Crime Watch programme, was 37 and had recently become engaged to be married later this year. We'll have full details on the ITV Evening News at 6.30. The detective who led the investigation into Jill Dando's murder has told the BBC her case will never be solved. In a documentary to mark 20 years since the news presenter was shot outside her home in Fulham, Hamish Campbell said he didn't think that any new suspects would be brought to court. Barry George was jailed for the murder but acquitted and released after a retrial. Sometimes I felt we were a day away from solving it and other times I thought, no, we're, we're a long way away. The senior officers, you know, they were asking, what are, what are the likelihoods of this case being resolved? Do I think somebody will come back to court? Probably not. No. Do you think that someone new might come to court? No. The things that bother me uh, with this was that, you know, they did arrest a guy. Uh, he... He's, he's had two names again. So there's, there's something wrong with this fella's mental health from the outset. He, he was called Barry Bulsara, aka Barry George. Um, and he was, you know, again, I'm not denigrating the guy, I don't know the guy, and I'm only going on, on, on the bits that, that I do know about it. But I'm 
I have met him um, at one of the um, civil courts in central London at the, what they call the general registry many years ago. And the one thing that struck me is you, you can clearly see that, that, that he's educationally subnormal. And again, I'm not decrying the guy and I'm not denigrating him. I, I'm, I'm pretty certain it's a fact that, that, that he's not the, the sharpest tool in the box, as it were. And he got accused and, and of this murder and he got um, he got charged. And But later, uh, he was acquitted. Um, but it's not the first time a high-profile murder that this has happened. Uh, but then there was this bigger picture around Jill Dando because there was speculation that it, this could have been a contract killing by um, a, a Serbian military group called, called the Black Wolves or something like that. Um, uh, um, yeah, a Serbian warlord was named in the case. Um, and then there was um, also question marks about a private life. He had quite a complicated private life. I think he, um, now, he just, had quite a Just touching on what you've, said, what you've said there, John, how often do you see warlords pop up in cases in the UK? I mean, was that not quite a, a, yeah, a standout? Yeah, a bizarre. Yeah, again, you wouldn't associate this woman with, with, you know, back then, no one really, apart from the, the, a lot of the wars that were cropping up in that part of the world, um, Serbia, you know, it, it was quite a sort of unknown country, really. Yeah. Um, so for an active Serbian paramilitary dissident group um, uh, to, to, to do such an obvious murder on the streets of London, well, you know, I mean, I never come across... I mean, talking 1999, that the groups of, of sort of active ethnic um, criminals we had, we had the Yardies were in their heyday. The Jamaican gangsters uh, were really active throughout the 90s. They sort of died off a bit. Yeah. Uh, Polish were, were coming over. You were getting a lot of Polish um, uh, coming like migrant workers, but then there was the criminal who went with them. One or two Lithuanians were coming at that time, so you were sort of getting them from that yeah. um, eastern, northeastern Europe, not not sort of like the central, southern, southeasterly part of um, Europe coming over. So, I, again, I never worked in special branch, so I didn't know. I wouldn't know. Maybe they could shed a bit more light. But to link this woman in with being an agitator um, to the point where they wanted a murderer, it seemed a bit out there. But one of the things is she, there was rumours that, that, that she'd had some sort of relationship or friendship with Cliff Richard, um, you know, the the um, famous sort of... Yeah, like, yeah, 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 Cliff Richard, like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Top yeah. Bar and everything else. And, then, yeah, yeah. Because, and later on, again, public domain stuff, Cliff, Cliff Richard um, it came out as wrongly accused of, of, of sexually offending against young boys or something like that. Um, he was accused of it. I think the police searched his house and, and all sorts, and he later on went on to sue them. So there was all question marks around that time about him. So, you know, maybe there was a connection there. I don't know. But <laughs> something that, that really later on... Now, in the police, if you're not involved in a case, right, they, they have a thing called the sterile corridor where... You won't know what's going on. They're, they're very good at, at their covert work, the police. You know, on a lower level, it comes across as, as sort of a little bit dysfunctional. But on a, on a real high, uh, high sort of covert level, they're, they're very, very professional in what they do. Um, and, and they are good. And in some of the, these investigations are highly, highly sensitive. And the, the public never really get to see the full extent of what the police get involved in. And, you know, some of it is is really dangerous sort of in-depth stuff. Um, but they won't tend to publicise what they're doing. But you'll, you'll have a mate who's got a mate or you'll know someone on these units and stuff gets linked out. And, of course, um, there's a lot of Freemasonry in the police as well and stuff gets linked out via them networks and things like that. So you, you would you would get information drip fed to you via various sources, and later on I was to to work with a guy that that was on it um, on, 
quite a senior level. And um, and he, he told me, he said that when um, the 999 call went out to the LAS, which is the London Ambulance Service, yeah. that 23 ambulances, double crewed ambulances, were dispatched to the crime scene. For, for, for Jill Dando's murder, 23 ambulances were dispatched? Yeah, that's what he told me. That's not and, normal, surely. No, it's not. Now, the problem you've got then is this. A crime scene has to be sterile in order for it to be of evidential worth, right? And how it gets explained is that uh, a crime scene should be like a field of pure white snow, all right? And in the middle is, is your victim. Got you. And you've got to get through that white snow to get to your victim, and you're going to leave what, what is termed as an audit trail. You're going to leave your footprints, okay? So we're talking uh, like metaphorical footprint, but, you know, these could be forensic footprints or, you know, uh, correspondence footprints, whatever. Yeah, no, it's a good analogy. So, it's a good analogy. Yeah, yeah. So, but you have to evidentially account for it. So when you go to court, they'll say, well, why is there two sets of footprints? Well, one set is I went to the victim, and the next set was me carrying the victim out. And that would be, so the court would say, right, we can understand that. So the more people go on to a, a crime scene, the more they contaminate it. So what you see is in the, the detective programs, there's always a uniform copper standing at the crime scene entrance because it gets, the error gets shut off uh, under regulation and, and under common law, uh, gets shut off and no one's allowed in. If you violate that, you're arrested. Right, so um, the officer has to take Details of everyone who goes in and then details of everyone who comes out. Right now, if you've taken, um, I don't know the exact road that Jill Dando lived on, but I've seen pictures of it. It's sort of like a, a 1930s um, uh, a, a detached, a semi detached type um, Georgian property or whatever yeah. it is, you know, Edwardian property. I can't, you know, uh, anyway, someone will correct me on that. Um, and the front gardens aren't huge. So if you've got, you know, 23 times two, so you've got 46 professionals all treading all over there, plus um, the police and everything else, you, you're not going to be able to account for all those footprints on, on our metaphorical snow. Uh, absolutely. Therefore, it's going to absolutely decimate and destroy um, that crime scene. Well, here, so here's, here's an um, interesting one, John. If you wanted to cover up... Let's just play devil's advocate. Let's say the people who are in charge of dispatching at the highest level ambulances had something to do with her murder, whether it was government, criminal, you know, politicians, whatever. The best way of destroying a crime scene without anybody complaining about it would be to flood it with medical assistance, right? Because no one's going to criticize you for sending too many medics to a murder scene, right? Yeah, um, okay. I mean, that's one way. And another, another thing, and we have seen this um, throughout um, travesties of injustice when people with educational is uh, issues, not very intelligent people, have been stitched up. I mean, we had Timothy Evans um, uh, was for the murders of what, what was termed as the Rillingham Place uh, John Christie mass murder. Yeah. And that Timothy Evans, who, who was not all fully there mentally uh, you know um we again he wasn't thanks for watching our podcast is with my sponsor it's ag1 by athletic greens so jen as a pregnant woman taking ag1 in the morning how's that helped you well with the low energy i've been having due to being pregnant ag1 has helped give me that morning boost that i've really craved but in mind if you are pregnant consult a doctor before taking ag1 Jen and I get AG1 delivered every month, which makes it super easy to have as a daily habit. With the single serving travel packs, I never have to miss a day. Just mixing the powder into the water, drinking it first thing every morning before breakfast. That simple. If you're looking for an easy way to take supplements, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. That's athleticgreens.com forward slash Sean. Check it out. That's the word from our sponsor. Thanks for watching. Link in the description box below this video for AG1. He wasn't fully there. And that's that guy, Colin Stagg, was um, 
again, wrongly accused, charged and, uh, and, and convicted and imprisoned for the murder of uh, Rachel Nickel. Now, and so we, we see that MO happening quite a bit. And, you know, no one questions it. And, and then, of course, who's that one, uh, the Bamba case, you know, the Jeremy Bamba case um, out in Essex as well. They're looking into that now, that he was actually stitched up and, again, wasn't really the, the cleverest person going. Um, so to, to say that it doesn't happen, you know, is a lie, because it does happen, and, it, and it's happened um, with quite a bit of frequency. Now, the other thing, if we go back um, to the crime scene, and uh, a criminal group that I mentioned earlier, like the Yardies, right? So the Yardies were, were the, the Jamaican men of violence, as they're, they're now termed, and they came over here um, with what was termed the crack wars. It started off in New York, um, and then they moved over here, and it was you know, basically organized crime, and it was being funded by the street selling of crack cocaine, and it was enforced with, with, with you know, extreme... Um, mortal violence. Now, what they didn't realise is that if you take this um, audit trail further back, you know, Jamaica was actually in the grip of, of almost a civil war. There was, there was um, Correct, a political yeah. war going on with, with, with the JLP, the, the, the Jamaican uh, Liberal Party was, was fighting against um, their, their political opponent, uh, the guy called Siagas was in charge, and it was a war. It was a, a war, and it was um, they were using street criminals as a militia and being paid by CR and, and all his, um, his government henchmen. And they were actually bringing that war onto the streets of London. And so London, for the first time, really, started experiencing drive-by shooting and things like that. Now, one of the MOs of... of of the really serious switched on yardy criminals was this that when whenever there was a shooting and you know and these tended to happen in the um the, the, the more sort of um black afro caribbean uh venues of london like holston in northwest london and southwest london you had Brixton, was that when, when if they stopped someone that the, the crime scene would go up the cordon would go up the police would come down and they were pretty um at dealing with it by then but what the gunman would do and it was it was simple but it was and it worked it was so ingenious but he would deliberately violate the cordon and walk through the crime scene and of course the police would come along and go what are you doing what you're doing and be sorry man sorry man i was listening to music or whatever it was and I went, well, we're going to have to put you on the crime scene log. Now you've walked through the crime scene. Oh, no, sorry, of course, man, I'll give you my details. Would feed the officer with the details. And then later when there was a forensic sweep and, and the, the analysis came back and, and the, the forensic footprint was there and it linked back to the gunman, well, when he got nicked, he said, yeah, of course I was on the scene forensically because the police had got my details because I accidentally walked through it and it would be corroborated by the crime scene log, and people go, oh, yeah, yeah, jury, and the jury would believe wow, it. yeah, damn. And so it was an age-old thing of, of putting yourself deliberately on that thing. Yeah, that's crazy. And do you, do you think there's any possible uh, calculation between her death, her work with Crime Watch, and maybe something connecting to these gangs and all this uh, war on the streets? Do you think maybe she got too close? Do you think maybe she, um, you know, <laughs> discovered something, was about to break something, and they just had to take her out? I mean, for, for me, the fact that they arrested somebody, charged them, and then he got acquitted, and it's just been left a mystery. What would be your analysis of... If you, if you had to put a fiver on what you think really happened, what, 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 what would you think... For me, for me um, and this really, I've got a massive bias here because um, I think that the majority of society's ills are down to childhood trauma and the AKA child abuse. Of course, so, yeah. So, see what's happened with the BBC in the past with Jimmy Savile and co uh, and the level of people that's been covered up anyone that holds information regarding that little mob, you know, that they're, they're aggressively um, silent. Maybe 
that, that she did have information regarding some Balkan terrorist group, maybe. I, I, I haven't really got much of an opinion on that. That could be a reality. I don't know. It's happened before the guy that was killed on Blackfriars Bridge, um, Aldo, and oh, I'll come, come to me in a minute, that was um, uh, stabbed in the leg with a, an umbrella that had a little um, poison to thing, and that was a, yeah, uh, yeah. contract killing from that sort of part of the world. Yep, I remember that and, one too, yeah. And then we've got the Novacek stuff, um, again, with the KGB operating, and I think there's been cases where Mossad have, have committed uh, murders over here, you know, political murders and things like that. So it has happened. I, I've always said and that, that people here controls global politics, and uh, maybe this woman knew about in high is and being her a very powerful risk yeah well here's here's an interesting one 1999 is when dando uh, was murdered and in yeah. 1999 there was a conversation between uh, jimmy savile and the presenter of have i got news for you what do you do in the caravan uh, anybody that can let me on from <laughs> What do you do in the caravan? Anybody that can let me on from? You used to be a wrestler, didn't you? Right. I need a lamp. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm feared in every girls' school in this country. <laughs> it was one of those interviews that when you read back the transcript, knowing what you know now, you see it in a different light. Do you think there's a possibility that she was ahead of everyone else in the detective work of the Savile case? And here's another question, do, two questions. Do you think it's possible for her to be connected to Savile and have known something? And second, do you think that we would still have an unsolved murder if Dando was killed now with social media uh, and the internet sleuth generation behind it? Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is an interesting one, isn't it? Because if you look, I know that the police works on intelligence. Like I said, um, the police work on intelligence uh, rather than investigation. So investigations do occur and, and they're very good, but initially it's intelligence, uh, you know, that, that instigates it. So anyone who thinks that they're caught, especially gang-related sort of um, uh, crime and, and, and dishonesty and armed robberies and things like that, where I think they're, they're caught by a sort of forensic uh, investigation, they're pretty stupid. Most people are caught because they've been grassed up. You know, get this right, you, you've been grassed up, and I'll say this quite boldly to a lot of um, uh, a lot of criminals, you know, usually there's a rat in the house, and, the, 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 you know, we haven't been someone who had a job of, of actively um, recruiting, and, and you know, and, um, a nurturing informants for many years. You know, I would be sent into prisons and all sorts to get people to talk. And uh, we did a lot of deals and a lot of, you know, real sort of sneaky beaky stuff to get information out of people. Now, Jill Dando, she was in the game of intelligence gathering. You know, Crime Stoppers information, Crime Watch, people calling up. They'd be calling up for all sorts. Now, if we think that they, it just stops with, with what they publicise, yeah, that information. This is a girl who has got that that lovely appeal to her. She comes across as a very clean person. Yeah. She doesn't come across as snobby, no. slutty, or anything like that. You could quite happily open your heart to her. Now, she's watching that, and, and she's really, you know, the poster girl for the fight against crime, yeah. serious, organised, just, just, dirty just to, crime. Just to pause you there for one second, John, just to sort of explain to anybody who is never seen or heard or are part of the Crime Watch generation, this is when there was no Google, there was no internet, and this was a TV show where literally people would phone in with tips on crime. There was, um, you know, local crimes, national crimes, robberies, house break-ins. It was a vast array of criminal activity that they were trying to solve. And the nation was obsessed with this show. It was massive. And it, when you look back at something like that, it almost was the, the, the way that the social media makes things travel so fast now it was that of the day where 
people would phone in. There was no, obviously no email or anything. It was all phone in, phone in, phone in. And it, it was a massive show. Uh, just to sort of put it in context for people who don't know, um, in case you're wondering, you know, why would a TV presenter who talks about crime be involved in all this? It was active solving of crimes and then the continual following up on, on cases. Uh, just, just, just so that people understand, John, I'm sorry to cut you off. It was just everything you were saying is completely relevant. I just needed to batter home to those who maybe don't understand the show format how prevalent uh, it was for its day yeah and like i was saying she she would have got information a lot of people would have rung up and wanted to give her information and they whenever they do a documentary about child abuse um afterwards they put up you know, if anyone's been affected by this please call this number the, these these call centers get inundated um there was one uh, Channel 4 did a documentary about abuse and they had a phone line and they expected five or six people to ring up. They were inundated with thousands and thousands of calls. The actual phone lines melted because too many people were calling up. Right Now, there'll be craziness in there, but in amongst that, there'll be some very, very serious, good quality information. Now, I would have thought that, that, that Jill Dando, that there, there was good information coming through. Now, uh, especially... Like we say, post um, Jimmy Savile, you know, or, or actually with Jimmy Savile, I'm sorry, because this happened before that, um, you know, when Savile would come on the screen in 2012, I think he died, Savile, and the BBC said there was nothing to investigate, and they were quite happy that, that Savile was, was, you know, beyond any sort of um, wrongdoing. And then when it went independent, it was taken out of the hands of self-adjudication. It turned out that this was one of the most prolific paedophiles who's ever been the face of the earth. But that was no surprise because the police had lots of information going back to the 1950s that Savile was a paedophile. And there would have been a lot of people connected to Jimmy Savile that would have... Um, that, that would have also had, had their names mentioned. Yeah. I mean, keep uh, in and, mind as well that the... That Crime Watch UK was also broadcast on the BBC, where you know yeah. they, they're at the centre of all of this, which is pinnacle uh, to this 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 theory. Well, well, and again, how many people when Savile came on would say he looks like a nonce on the telly with Jim or Fix It? But but that aside, how many people when Savile come on have been sexually abused by him and would have actually screamed the house down? turn that tear thin telly off and everything else. There would have been loads of them, but no one would have believed them. But when it come out, it went into the thousands you know, that it had done. Not, not a couple, not a dozen, a thousand. And we see this all the time. We see this with, um, with, with, with Lord Janna. Uh, again, anyone who spoke about him being, being a, a... They were threatened with lawsuits by, by his um, barrister's son and, and everything else. And of course, post his death, the, the, the independent government sanctioned IICSA inquiry um, had a whole strand on him alone. You know, so it, it does come out later. So there would have been a lot of information. Now, now she might have had a lot of information, not, not only what was given to her as a result of her job as a presenter on this highly popular uh, uh, crime program, but also what she experienced working in that environment as well. And I would have thought colleagues would be very comfortable talking to her. Maybe colleagues came to her and said, look, that Jimmy Savile went, and others, right? Um, bear in mind, she did mention one other celebrity, said that is not the Christian man you think he is. And again, it's someone who claims to be a, a, a very committed Christian. And um, there was a comment made about that. Maybe they given her information there, yeah. and that would have made her um, a hot property. And as we all know, um, us that do whistleblow, yeah. the, the first thing they do is is they try and silence you by threatening yeah. you. When that doesn't work, they ultimately um, they kill you. Yeah. Um, or they or they um, imprison you, or they, um, uh, you know, sexing you. So, yeah. Either way, you know, it's going to be a painful journey for you. Yeah. And maybe what she had, and she, she, she might have had um, her in a conscience telling her, no, you, you can't let this lie. Yeah. Um, we don't know. But 
to stitch up, and they did stitch him up. That you know that that guy was despicable. Look at the parallels between that um, and the, the Rachel Nichol thing as well. What they do with Colin Stagg, it's the same thing. They they get the detectives in, and they they basically tell them, look, this man's done it. We yeah. we want a conviction. And yeah. A former police detective who exposed Jimmy Seville believes that Jill Dando was assassinated because of her work on the BBC series Crime Watch. Mark Williams Thomas, who now works as a TV investigator, said in an exclusive interview with the Daily Mirror that she died at the orders of a Mr. Big to warn off others from probing a crime clan. He said, My theory is that Jill was gunned down on the orders of a London underworld Mr. Big to send out a direct, bloody message to others, do not take on organized crime. Mr. Williams Thomas found an intelligence report naming two men from Islington, North London, who were said to be acting for one of the capital's biggest crime families after examined more than 52,000 documents in the Dando files. He said, it suggested Jill was being targeted for investigating crime on television. The report goes on to detail how after shooting her the men disposed of the murder weapon in a canal on their home turf. But the lead detective on the Dando case, DCI Hamish Campbell, ordered no further action on the report as the prime suspect Barry George had already been charged. A memo submitted to detectives names a registered source who was at the time serving life for murder. An officer who went to quiz him in prison on February 1, 2001, came back with the two men's names, which cannot be revealed for legal reasons. The intelligence report goes on to say the gun was broken into four pieces, which were thrown into a canal in Islington. One of the men was later identified but detectives found no apparent link to the crime family. The other was seemingly never found. Mr. Williams Thomas said, whoever was to blame for killing Jill, it is my strong belief there is one key reason why they were allowed to slip through the net of the biggest police manhunt since the Yorkshire Ripper. The 47 detectives in the Kensington incident room had become too focused on nailing George, Jill's loner neighbor. He was jailed for murder in July 2001 but freed in 2008 after a retrial. So Jill may have signed her own death warrant through her work on Crime Watch. Every month she, Nick Ross and their team helped bring villains to justice through the show which attracted 9 million viewers. There are several reasons why I'm convinced a contract killer shot Jill. First, she was shot with a single bullet to the head which indicates they were well trained enough to know that would be enough. I believe the gunman considered taking lives to be all in a day's work and was paid handsomely. He also got a buzz from pulling off the perfect murder. A second major factor which supports the hitman theory is the fact that on a busy London street in broad daylight, no one saw the shooting or could even say for sure they had seen him. He just slipped away. Third, he vanished without a trace of DNA or any other evidence, bar the bullet. During my research, the respected criminologist David Wilson told me, everything about this murder screams out professional hit. It has all the hallmarks. I have explored many other theories, including a Serbian hit, an IRA revenge killing and a maniac who sent a letter threatening to kidnap and rape Jill and colleague Alice Beer just a month before her death. But the most compelling motive is the Crime Watch link. I will pass my findings from the Dando files to Scotland Yard and urge them to start a fresh investigation. This evening, the television presenter Jill Dando has been murdered outside her home in West London. She'd once said that she feared her job as a presenter of the Crime Watch program may have made her a potential target herself. Speculation that the killing may have been revenge for her anti-crime work. Here is a word from today's sponsor, Aura. If you Google someone, you can find out all kinds of personal information about them. This information is accessible because of data brokers who profit by selling your information to robocallers, telemarketers, spammers. You can use my link, https... Dot dot forward slash forward slash aura.com aura is a-u-r-a forward slash sean atwood s-h-a-u-n-a-t-t wood to try two weeks for free and see how many data brokers are sharing your info also linked in my description box on this youtube version 
or scan the QR code on the screen. Aura also monitors your emails and passwords to see if they were involved in a data breach and exposed on the dark web and gives you the recommendations on what to do. Aura has almost every internet safety tool you'll ever need all inside one app. I mean, to be honest with you, uh, John, this is one of those cases. There's so many cases like this that have this like haunting era or haunting sort of um, element of conspiracy and cover up. This case is one of those ones that if you guys want to hear more theories on this or you would like a maybe a longer video uh, where we dive into the, the the Savile side of things a little bit more deeply uh, i can we can arrange to do that so let us know in the comments but well, well there, you know there's, there's been quite a few where you know that this if you look at the disappearance of susie lamplu in a very similar part of london only a couple of miles away i think she went missing from chiswick or something like that yeah and um again very strange um affair that was and and, and a very bizarre investigation yeah. and no one was ever ever um convicted of it and i don't think she was ever found either um but the, the rachel nickel one is really really interesting well, and this shows yeah how you the real arrogance of, of when when the police get their targets just what they say is the mind's like a parachute yeah it only works when it's open and it's a very closed minded approach yeah and they they arrested this guy Colin Stagg and and there was a an entrapment case. It was an adjunct provocateur um, and some you know highly unlawful. But, but, well, the, the the thing is with with this, yeah. Because you know my point on this one uh, is uh, it, in fact it's that it, it's the the way that these murder teams work and the pressure that that is put on them and how for whatever reasons. Um, whether they're fair or foul, that, that the wrong decision is made and they stick to it and they don't relent. Now, um, Rachel Nickel was actually murdered by a guy called Robert Napper. And Robert Napper had actually murdered a woman, uh, I think called um, Samantha Blissett, in Plumstead in South East London. And he'd actually, after murdering um, Samantha and, and her young daughter, a horrific injuries, I think he, he sliced them both up. Um, he actually went into a police station and, well, he told his mum, look, I've killed a girl and I've killed someone else. And he actually went into a police station and said, look, I think I've killed um, a woman somewhere. And they, they thought he was a nutcase and told him to F off. Um, and and the, the similarities between um, Samantha Blissett and Rachel Nickel and the murders, even how they look, were, you know, were, were quite striking. And, and, and geographically, they weren't that far apart either. And, and bear in mind, this guy, he even proffered himself up as being the suspect, and he just wasn't believed. And then they went on this highly expensive, highly unlawful, adjunct provocateur entrapment, honey trap operation, in which they used a, a, a level one covert undercover UC uh, woman to, to basically groom a confession, uh, or half a confession, out of Colin Stagg, who didn't seem to be the full ticket either. And when they did a programme, this is before Stagg actually um, ended up getting compensation and Napa eventually um, was convicted of it. There was, there was a programme about the investigation and they interviewed the senior investigating officer, DCI Solomon, so I can't even remember his name, and he made this totally bold yet arrogant statement that no matter what happens we will never be looking for another suspect do you think basically this is, saying it's colin stagg and that's that when it bloody well wasn't do you think that this is again where we talked about the tactic used for covering up crime scene evidence with the medical staff do you think by picking somebody who has got mental issues or appears to be um mentally challenged in some way is another go-to uh, tactic, especially when the, well, the well, Zando case is yeah, well. yeah. I, I, I think what we've got to do, I mean, we can overcomplicate things and and look, I'm not saying that conspiracies don't exist because I got caught up in a major conspiracy, so so they, they do exist. Um, uh, but 
some people see a conspiracy in everything uh, and it muddies the water. And sometimes the simplest explanation is a correct one. True. Um, but, you know, when, when the government really go to work and they cover something up, as I well know, they will do their best to do a Rolls Royce job. Um, if anyone ever wants to watch a film which really sums up this sort of espionage and cover up, watch a film called Michael Clayton. Uh, with with George Clooney in it, it is superb and it's uh, corporate, but it, it pretty much goes to show how a government will cover up um, whistleblowers and and murder them and everything else. It's fantastic, and I think it's very much based on on the truth. But we also have to look at laziness and ineptitude and arrogance and all these other sort of um, poisonous traits that go with elitism. And I think in respect to Rachel Nickel, that's basically what happened. I don't think there was um, an agenda, really, to um, to stitch up um, Colin Stagg and contaminate a crime scene. And, you know, I don't think there was any intelligence that linked to some sort of higher uh, nefarious group. Um, yeah. I think that was, that was basically was down to arrogance, yeah. laziness, ineptitude, ego, all put into a toxic mix and and that's what it's spewed out as whereas rachel nickel my opinion is is something very very nefarious organized um and dangerous at work um i think she stumbled across something for me i don't think it it was to do with political espionage and that i think it was to do with philia that's my opinion I might be wrong. I've got nothing more to base it on other than the environment she was in, the people she was around, and subsequently what came out um, for the filth that that, that was, um, you know, festering in the BBC and especially in that celebrity world. So um, I think she had information. And on top of information, she had integrity. And that wasn't going to be negotiable. And therefore, she had to go. And... They shot our point black range and stitched the guy up with it. That's my opinion. We've covered some ground here on the Jill Dando case. I think it's important that you all understand that these are these are theories that we're putting forward. This is an open discussion. We want to hear your views in the comments, whether you think that uh, Dando was murdered because she knew too much, or if you have another theory, let us know. The reason that John was bringing up other cases during this is it really paints a picture of the reality of cover-ups and how far the government, um, massive corporations like the BBC will go in order to keep their secrets. And with the the prolificness of Savile and the, the time in the era, it isn't far-fetched for us to conclude that there is a high probability that these women, these individuals knew way too much and the, the price of keeping their silence was to end their life. And it's not out of the question, but we're not saying that's what happened. We're merely opening a discussion. So let us know. John, what, in, have you got a conclusion for us? Let us know um, your, your final thoughts on this. Uh, it, it, for me, it, it's not something I've, I've spent <clears throat> a huge amount of time going over. All I can say with it is that I have spoken to a few people um, that I work with that, that did get involved with it. I know that she did have a complicated personal life, um, which could have caused a few issues. But the main th question mark that, that really got me was, you know, the, the, the crime scene just getting, un you know, adulterated very, very early on when it should have been kept totally sterile. The huge amount of ambulances that were dispatched, you know, the amount of people that, um, seemed to lawfully trample over what, what should have been, you know, a sterile area um, and making it unworkable and unusable. I mean, that, that stinks to me. Why would that be done? And again, like I keep saying about, you know, the suspect in this, Barry George, a.k.a. Borsara, or, you know, and all that. Um, this guy clearly isn't, you know, and I've met him, he clearly isn't the full shilling. This isn't the first time we, we, we've seen um, miscarriages of justice and cover-ups. You know, they, they do happen. Yeah, and, and, and like so, I say, you're, you're talking from experience as well, John. It's not just, you, you have got a little bit more 
sway well, when it comes to yeah, talking yeah. about this. Well, 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 let, well let, me, let me tell you something, right? Um, having been a career detective and spent the majority of my working life um, in the Metropolitan Police, uh, if anyone thinks that the police don't lie and cover up, then they're, they're massively mistaken. They do lie and they do cover up. And they do it with, with daily frequency. It happens all the time. You know, the amount of coppers that um, give false testimony, whether it's a minor thing or a major thing, they'll do it. And that they'll lie in their evidence. Um, their friends will collude with them in, in, in lying in evidence. And they'll win because of, of, because of that collusion and sheer weight of numbers. It's a war of attrition. You know, they, they've got the money and the people to see it through, and you haven't. And if you've got three people saying, you know, with... with very respectable careers, you know, no reason to question honourable members of society saying something happened and you're saying it didn't, well, then you're going to lose. And it's not just the police, I've, the social services, I've seen them lie, medical staff lie, and it happens all the time. And when people are in trouble, they lie to cover it up. They do it all the time. We do it constantly. I mean, garages do it when they... um forgot to fix your car and they're like oh we're just waiting on the parts to come in it's a minor lie but they're doing it to cover up their ineptitude yeah uh, but the police are fine-tuned it and so you do get that on, a, on people doing it out of incompetence and laziness they will lie because they don't want to get in trouble right um does that make that a conspiracy well not really um does that make it it is corruption, but does it make it this big sort of um, major cover-up? No, not, not really, not in my opinion. But there are cases when the government need to silence something, so, something or someone, and they will pull all their stops out to do it. And I know because I've been involved um, in, in one certain case where there was a need um, for this guy to, to be silenced. And... Um, yeah. And I saw it in action, and I saw it at a very, very high senior level yeah. when they go to work and they target someone um, and, and they that's, basically that's... officially stitch that person up. And I've seen it, and yeah. I've seen it in operation. To see it, and to see it firsthand must uh, be and, 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 so yeah, destroying, so it does, John. It does go on. It does go on. But, so, I mean, how did that make you feel? Within wheels. How did that make you feel, though, when you first experienced that as an officer? Sorry to prolong, uh, it, prolong Yeah, this. no, it, uh, um... It's, it's it's quite frightening because it's serious and it, and it's it's sanctioned at such a high level and it's so well orchestrated and everyone's in on it. Um, you know, there will come a time when um, when when I'll I'll speak out about yeah, this. Yeah. Um, I understand. And, what you're and saying. you know, the guy they did it to um, is he's quite he's quite a famous. Um, uh, youtuber now and and he he actually went on the press and he, he thanked me for treating him with total respect because i told him what's happening i said listen they're, they're out to get you mate they're well listen let's, let's not tease and, the uh, public too much on things that uh you, you can't talk on because it sounds like no, a, no, it sounds no, like a no, juicy right. one I, I, I'm not gonna, um, and the comments go are going to go nuts now uh with you teasing us on that and i just yeah. i just want to say just for those who maybe don't know as well the BBC is a government a government body, or at least it was back in the Savile era and the Jill Dando era. So if you think that they wouldn't have an interest in eliminating somebody, they are the, the BBC in during that era was a, a serious, serious organization with immense power. And I honestly think the discussion in the comments has to be focused on what do you guys think? Do you think this is nonsense? Do you think, do you agree with us? Jimmy you know. Savile, right? How many children did he abuse on their property? Do you know what, John? It was, it, it was children. It was anyone. He was, a, he was, yeah, yeah. he was an opportunistic exactly. monster. Yeah. You know? And, and, and how many people he worked with knew what he was doing. They knew what he was doing. Of course. Um, I'm I'm not convinced with the Louis Farouk documentary, the second one he yeah, did. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, this is an investigative journalist, a yeah. very intelligent guy, and he's claiming he didn't know. And it's yeah. quite interesting because one of the um, victims confronts him and said, oh, come on, Louis, you're really telling us that you didn't yeah. know what he was? And he even, in the first documentary, puts it to him that you're a nonce, Mr. Savile, you're a nonce. 
is he isn't he a paedophile yeah. line basically yeah. Yeah. and then he sort of he just gets enamoured by this guy and it's it's a very worrying well, do you know, um, do you know uh, John and the, like you'll on. know you'll know yourself right the most charismatic individuals in the world can be monsters look at um, Ted Bundy right Ted Bundy Ted Bundy of course yeah, the, Ted chari Bundy, yeah. the charismaticness you could engage people I mean I've, I've talked to many active horrific bastards on and, and, and the high, high IQ as well yeah, well this is the thing they it, it, you can have a monster sat in front of you, be almost convinced that he is a monster, and then they can turn the table with charisma, charm, and all yeah. of that. For anyone who's been sucked in by somebody like Savile or, you know, a monster like that, they have fine-tuned themselves. And a lot of people have guilt. They can't live with themselves when they, they feel like they should have picked up on things. And y you've got to sort of let go of that because these are finely-tuned tactics by... <laughs> horrific horrific creatures that normal people can't relate to there's no way that you can understand fully what goes on in these people's heads because they're not wired like you and me oh, well well they're, and they're not and there, there is a specific way of, of dealing with, with with highly intelligent files when it comes to interviewing um even the questioning style it, it's a very very clever tactic which, which i actually used to teach and you keep your questions um, down to a minimum and, and they keep them very open indeed without giving much away about yourself. Correct, because yeah. people, when you ask a question, what you're actually doing is you are giving away something about you and your intention. And a clever person can read that question in and they can work out who you are, what you're about and your insecurities by the questions that you ask and you can see that when people guys do it all the time when they're chatting up a woman oh well, who are you with you with your friends no trying to work out she's already sussy trying to work out if i've got a boyfriend yeah well it's, it's the know, theory of that, every and, every interaction's a negotiation you know it sounds, yeah, it sounds yeah, of course it is and and a clever person can work that out and turn it round and manipulate that person so of course with sex friends you've got to be very very clever how how you deal with them sometimes it's beneficial to build that rapport and to have what they call retroposity i give you something you give me something and and on, on, nine times out of ten it works very well unless you being a human yeah and you being just a salesman and being nice to get what you want the best but information times, it can be the best information yeah. is usually uh, extracted when the individual feels like they're in their comfort zone and their guards down a little bit. Well, and that's well, when... Well, do, do you know, it's very interesting you say that because this came out of, of the um, the MO of the intelligence services. Now, now what, what the um, the other side was doing was, was basically torturing people to get information. Now, now, torture works to a degree, but then you get to a point where it, it makes no difference. You know, so when um, we would interview people from west africa for example that naturally they will lie to us because the police in west africa are, are just going to beat them up so whatever they tell yeah. them first you're just going to get beat up anyway so you might as well tell them a lie and then after about the fifth or sixth beating then you better tell them the truth yeah. right and then there comes a point where you've beaten someone so badly when you get to the real extreme stuff that that is pointless you when when you kick someone's head in constantly over a period of days their body shuts down and their mind shuts down so what is the point and of course you know, it does yeah. so all right john listen this has been absolutely fascinating some of the things you went into there we've had to sort of uh, cover up because the the things you were talking about and the tactics used were were so detailed that it almost felt like we were trying to educate the the public on how to yeah, avoid yeah. Uh, interrogation so thank you so much for joining us the jill dando case open discussion down uh, in in the comments and we'll see you again very soon john because hopefully this will be a, a little series that we can uh, we can keep going so thank you for joining us mate and 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 all the best yeah yeah you know it's been an absolute pleasure and it, not, there's nothing new under the sun and if if it's you know if it's not Jill Dando, the McCanns, or whatever, yeah. there'll there'll be another case coming up, and it, we, you know it will be the same pattern. We'll yeah. see. We are going to see this, this same pattern emerging. Yeah. 
And if you watch the, watch the Netflix um, documentaries on, on unsolved murders and whatnot, you see the same pattern yeah. emerging all the time. So, um, yeah, there's nothing new under the sun. And, and again, sometimes you're dealing with narcissists. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your um, suicide awareness and, and all your work you're doing on that, John. Links yeah. will be in the description for all of that if anyone's affected or wants to support John on that. So let us know a little bit about that. Right, so it's hashtag... PSAD, it's an acronym, Pants Swimming Against Depression. And having been someone who, who has suffered from depression, uh, borderline alcoholism, chain smoking, all sorts of things, um, chemicals never caused my problem and they weren't going to cure it either. Um, and so what I did um, to, to really cure myself, I started doing cold water therapy. And, and for me, that was swimming in a lake yeah um i've decided to document it video uh, uh, vlog it yeah and and since christmas day i've put together usually on a week sometimes uh you know twice a week i've been doing um videos some of them live of me swimming in my pants in various inland and open water uk locations no. really to highlight the benefits the unparalleled unbelievable benefits of cold water swimming in respect to curing depression and taking away suicidal thoughts and tendencies right. and it really does work not just that eliminate addiction uh negative thinking oh I, well I, 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 it doesn't stop there it, it, yeah. it boosts your immune system and everything it is fantastic yeah. so it's hashtag peace ad and it's doing incredibly well wicked well listen ladies if if you've ever wanted to see a police officer in his underpants, this is your opportunity. <laughs> it's for a good cause. And uh, listen, we'll talk a little bit about, about that next time, but certainly it's fascinating because if you've got a bathtub, you can try this and you don't have to be depressed. It's something that is sweeping uh, the world now is uh, cold water therapy. So look into it. But listen, thank you, John, for joining us. Thank you, the, the viewer, for, for, uh, for, for listening, for, for watching. And if you want more, leave a like. Please subscribe with the bell on. It doesn't take two minutes. I mean, we've, we've sat here and provided this awesome content. Subscribe, share, go and tell your granny and your friends to come and watch it because the algorithm is a monster we are all competing again so help us out thank you very much for joining us from me ron swanson on the sean atwood channel as always be safe out there